Hey folks, welcome to Narratives. Narratives is a podcast exploring the ways in which the world is better than in the past, the ways it is worse, and the paths towards a better, more definite vision of the future. I'm your host, Will Jarvis, and I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to this episode. I hope you enjoy it. You can find show notes, transcripts, and videos at narrativespodcast.com. In this episode, we're joined by Quinn Lewandowski, Suspended Reason, and Crispy Chicken. We get started with Crispy Chicken kicking us off in defining terms. This conversation really gets going about a third of the way through. I think you'll enjoy this. Maybe the first thing we should do is uh, define anti-inductivity. And there's already been some debate uh, between me and Suspended about what that means. So I'll give my definition and he can give his if, he, if it differs uh, significantly. Which So my definition is a game is anti-inductive if by playing a certain move um, that helps me, I, A, leak information that can be used um, to B, make other people's strategies better. So I first leak information about my strategy and that strategy can be meaningfully used by other people. And there are games where people are playing for different enough things that this doesn't occur, right? So like, even if you know my strategy, it doesn't help you win. Maybe we're playing for different prizes. Um, but you know, obviously the stock market is a perfect example because literally by buying, right, the um, price goes up. But the kind of, uh, the thing that I like to say that uh, is anti-inductive that we have a lot of the talk on the server about is uh, flirting, right? I think flirting is anti-inductive because when too many people start using the same strategy for the same identity markers, they become a sign that actually what you're doing is not letting me into your authentic self. You're using a strategy marker that people have come to associate with authenticity. Um, so by doing something, you leak a strategy and it becomes less effective because other people can use it. And when everyone's using it, it's not that effective. Huh. Um, I guess I like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you guys want to jump in or should I give my, my definition? No, go ahead. And, and how does All it right. differ, perhaps? Yeah, well, I mean, I think one way I kind of want to want to talk about these things, um, which I think is different than, I think people have, there's a natural incentive to present um, information and concepts as like solidified um, and as these kind of essential things. Um, and they're not that, um, they're kind of always under debate. They're always getting gerrymandered. Um, they're always getting re-legislated. The boundaries are shifting. Um, and so many of these concepts, it's actually like, you can use them very pragmatically um, for a long time in a discursive field without actually having like a super rigorous um, definition, because you essentially have like some kind of shared conception of like a certain local um, zone in which this concept works. And you don't really know about the edge cases, you don't, you haven't really nailed down and you can run into trouble depending on um, you know, different scenarios you run into. But I mean, for this concept, for example, um, when we were having a conversation the other night, I think we have recently in the last week come to a head where we've realized that we, that me, Crispy, and then also another kind of, you know, quote unquote colleague or, or friend of ours, uh, Natural Hazard, use this term in meaningfully different ways um, and yet have been able to talk for the last six months without realizing we all have different <laughs> definitions of this term. Um, which is something that Hazard uh, would call the delusion of discourse, right? That um, we all kind of mean different things and we're constantly talking past each other. And most of the time when we're in this abstraction land, it almost doesn't even matter. We couldn't even tell. We wouldn't know whether we're using different meanings because there's no kind of grounding that would, would differentiate or test one versus the other. But so I guess there's, there's kind of two clusters of anti-inductive systems that I've been thinking about um, that might be distinct or might be the same. Um, so one is the, are those in which um, there are kind of these zero sum research uh, resources which are publicly visible and are gonna be grabbed. And so like the $20 bill on the ground in Grand Central is a classic example of this. Um, and then there's kind of a second kind of anti-inductive system in which, um, you know, these winning strategies are constantly being learned because they leak information, like Crispy said. So as soon as like I employ a certain strategy, many games have a certain amount of legibility where my opponent can see, oh, he did this move and he won the game. And so now in the future, I'm going to use that move to win the game. 
Or alternatively, I'll figure out a countering move so that that winning move they just played can't continue, you know, steamrolling me. Um, and so, you know, both of these are cases where, um, you know, these are systems in which excess returns or kind of premium value is difficult to find. Um, and or like there's kind of a short term efficacy of any discovery. So if I'm to discover a new strategy or new play or new low hanging fruit, there's kind of it's it's only available temporarily. Um, if I don't get to it immediately, someone else will. And, you know, if I can't gobble up all the kind of excess value, a bunch of other people will quickly notice that I'm profiting in a premium way and and come swoop in. So that's that's where I'm at. Super quick, five seconds, I'll throw in kind of the third definition that I think this isn't one that I mess around with, but this is maybe more hazards. And so I'll just kind of represent them by proxy here. I think Heath views anti-inductive games or systems as those which have no kind of complete winning move. Um, so a game like checkers or tic-tac-toe is solved. Like, whereas other games, um, your success in employing a certain move is always dependent on other people's moves. Um, and that kind of context sensitivity means there's always this kind of moving edge or this treadmill that you have to keep up with. Um, there's never a final solution to the game. It depends on who you're playing and what they know and how it's going down. It's really interesting. Huh. And I can see how those would, in, some, in a lot of cases, I bet those would output very similar predictions. I wonder if it's like mapping the territory to different ontologies, but if maybe it's getting at the same thing. Yeah, I yeah. agree. I think though the the place where it differs is basically the kind of prizes you're fighting for, right? So yeah. I think when you start fighting for private goods instead of public goods, actually anti anti inductivity gets super complicated because the question is who can watch your moves, how much are you leaking information to cooperators, and how much what is a cooperator a well defined thing versus someone who's trying to steal your strategy? Whereas you know with the stock market, this is all factored out because it's super super public on purpose. Yeah, that's good. And, yeah. I also think your, your kind of comment about map territory stuff, I mean, I think that's really important here and, and it kind of connects to what I was saying earlier about people presenting these concepts as just like existing. The concepts don't exist in the world. The concepts are metaphors for describing patterns. Um, and, you know, unless you're dealing with something like math, it's really just your, all you have is metaphor. And so there can be these kind of mutually conflicting or mutually amenable metaphors that are just describing the same thing or similar clusters. But. I've been noticing, I've been trying to figure out, for instance, um, you know, there are different metaphors this way that like, um, as you're making decisions through time, um, your kind of uh, possibility space somehow diminishes or like freezes and there's different metaphors you can use. And so you have like this garden of forking paths idea, right? Where like, um, the fact of like parentage and the way a tree structure works is that like, as you go down a path, um, all these other like branching paths are no longer available to you. Like if you can't go back, you can only go forward down this, this, this tree structure, you know, if you have a kind of binary, um, you know, you have three decisions that are yes or no's, um, you know, at the beginning you have eight final points that you could land at, but you make your first decision and now you only have four possible places. And after two decisions, you only now have two. So there's kind of that metaphor. And then there's also kind of this idea of like annealing and this metaphor of simulated annealing where things kind of like solidify into a structure and they become harder and harder to change. So, you know, as time moves forward and you create, you know, airline bookings and hotel bookings and you coordinate with family and all these things, it becomes harder and harder to change the plan because you've kind of annealed it to place. And I think at the end of the day, all we kind of have to describe this stuff is metaphors. And that's why we're kind of in the realm of what I think Crispy and I and Hazard and some of the other folks that, you know, hang out and chat about these, these problems call inexact sciences. Um, stuff that is a little bit more than philosophy or art, maybe, you know, we're trying to take concepts from philosophy and art, maybe add a little bit of rigor to them or make them kind of pay rent, but they're not nearly at the point of a science where, you know, we can actually apply math to this. Uh, we're still in the land of metaphor. That makes a lot of sense. Definitely. And it was kind of an unfilled niche. I mean, you read C.P. Snow talking about the two cultures, and there isn't a third culture that's halfway in between the other two. 
Well, knowledge economies are inadequate equilibria, right? Because otherwise you wouldn't expect such a, a you know, rich niche to go unexploited for so long. And yet here we yeah. are. Um, yeah. one, one concept that we like a lot um, is this idea of a rigorizing pipeline. And I kind of was inspired by Kevin Sharp, the philosopher. But basically this idea that like the goal of philosophy to some extent is to kill itself and that it's a kind of fact of the field that philosophy is always shrinking. So 500 years ago, philosophy included, um, you know, life sciences and chemistry and biology and all these things. And as philosophy has kind of got these concepts to a point where they're like more tractable and testable, they become sciences and they actually kind of leave the home, the kind of childhood home of philosophy and, and grow up. And, you know, I think that in this kind of pipeline, which maybe on the far left end starts with art and literature and philosophy, um, and then slowly kind of moves through to the social science and psychology and psychoanalysis, and then, you know, all the way up to physics at the far right end. I think there are a lot of kind of structural incentives for uh, fields to jump ahead of themselves and get ahead of themselves because, right, you can get more grant funding if you're a science, which is why the social sciences call themselves the sciences, even though they're not really sciences. Um, so I think there's kind of this part of the reason this niche is unexploited is because there are active like financial incentives in terms of grants and legitimacy and prestige and being taken seriously um, to presenting yourself as more rigorous than you are. And then on the other hand, maybe there are some incentives to kind of taking the loosey goosey far left end of art and literature where you're not really held accountable for your ideas. Definitely. Well, you know, no real science calls themselves a science, you know, it's biology, physics, and chemistry, and then it's, you know, social science, right? I mean, it's, it's notable to me. Um, it is. It's not physical science or chemical science or anything like that. Crispy, where does NLP fall in all this? Like, how would you position NLP in the rigorizing pipeline? That's a good question. I mean, so I, um, I've been told that there are two ways you can define what a field does. You can define it very broadly as to the goals that a field says that it pursues, and you can define it as who's in the field now and what are they actually doing. Um, right. The internal story versus like the actual, like what's going on. Exactly. Um, and so I think, you know, the, uh, you know, the story of NLP is a lot like the story of biomechanics. Biomechanics means the mechanics of your knee. It also means like literal physical tiny things that you have to study with electron microscopes. Um, like it's just, oh, it's mechanical and it's in a biological system. <laughs> Very broad. <laughs> exactly. So I think natural language processing is a lot like that. Well, it has language and we better process it with a machine. Um, that's, that's NLP. Um, I think right now it's a very, very broad field. Um, but realistically, right now, there's this revolution of language models like GPT-3, um, where these things can do so, so much out of the box without even any training. And with a little bit of more training, um, they can do these crazy things that we didn't think we could do a few years ago. Um, and they reveal also that like the way we've been testing things is probably not even like actually testing the thing we want to. It was just a good enough test before because our uh, algorithms and models weren't good enough to, to kind of bypass the easy way out of these tests. So I think right now, I would say uh, like the majority of um, NLP, even if it's not focused on language models is basically grappling with how do we define what's possible in this space? Um, and because of that, it's, very, very close to the ground in terms of hypotheses, but in some sense, because of that, it's actually almost closer to engineering. Engineering is also about hypotheses. Engineering is about the hypothesis, can I make this happen? And I think that's the kind of hypothesis you see entertained in NLP because saying, is this possible? Well, how do you really prove anything like that when we've just shown that our own way of conceptualizing what's possible and not is, is not robust enough to handle these kind of advancements? That works. Can we do it? It's a lot more testable. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I, I think the unfortunate side of that is that um, I, I kind of think that there's um, what I would call a crisis of conceptualization, um, mm -hmm. which is I really just don't think you can easily publish a conceptualization paper unless you already have clout. Um, and interestingly, there's been a new round of conceptualization papers. Recently, there was. Um, uh, one of the major uh, NLP conferences had this instance where they specifically asked 
for what they call theme papers, which are basically, you don't need results papers. Um, talk about what's interesting in the field, where it's going, what doesn't work, how, how to actually think about these things. And so I think there is hunger for this, but I still think that the academic aesthetics are, well, sure, maybe you can include a little bit of conceptualization, but you really should have shown that there's some experiment that you can run where the numbers are higher if that would have happened. And don't get me wrong, I think in general, like it should always come down to that in the end if you're really uh, an engineering field, which I think NLP is. Um, but I think the problem is you usually can't make these kinds of conceptual advancements in one paper. So you, there needs to be a discourse that actually gives birth to some of the ideas that are eventually tested. And I think that discourse is it's basically almost taboo to participate in unless you already have justified yourself. And so you can write a blog post, but if you haven't read a blog post and you, um, and you, you are not that famous yet, then everyone's like, what are you doing wasting your time with these blog posts? You've got to go outside and prove yourself. And then we select for the people who spent all of their times either politically deciding to prove themselves or who only care about like the very grounded hypotheses. And there's benefit to that, but I think it basically holds us back when you get to these really incredibly complicated conceptual spaces, which I think is where we are in now. I think, you know, that we don't know how to test, you know, generative capabilities of models. We have some vague ideas, but like, we don't know how to say, oh yeah, it can do this thing and maybe it can't do that thing. Crispy, I want to throw a thought at you that I've kind of just had because you had a post a couple of days ago, um, sort of touching on some of these themes. Um, and you mentioned that, you know, colleagues in some of these fields, um, you know, might, might kind of look at like conceptual work or theorizing as like, well, you know, we're not going to get anywhere if we just have a bunch of people writing about these things. And we have kind of this hunch that like, uh, uh, on one hand, what we desperately need is like good conceptual frameworks in order to make things tractable. Like um, getting back to this kind of rigorizing pipeline, like what actually makes like, what gets something from philosophy to a science? And I think there are two answers there. I think one answer is like stamp collecting because you need a lot, a lot of examples and you need to understand the domain space really well in order to then, you know, start pulling patterns and theorizing, right? You need um, uh, a, a good kind of encyclopedia of species before you can have a Darwin. But I think the second part of it is that you need the concepts in the right place. Like you need to do all this conceptual work so that things can actually be tested and tractable. Um, and so it's clear that like if these fields are kind of jumping ahead of themselves, then what we're saying is they probably haven't done either their stamp collecting work or their conceptual work. And, uh, you know, obviously a field like uh, NLP has massive corpuses. So in a sense, it's not really maybe a tax or, or a, a stamp collecting problem. It's really a conceptual problem. And yet we've done, at the, uh, on the other hand, we've done so much conceptual work in linguistics, like the, the biggest shit, the biggest kind of trend in philosophy in the 20th century was language, you know, the linguistic turn, and it permeated almost every field. Um, there's been so much kind of angsty theorizing about how language works. Um, and so one question is like, why haven't we actually gotten somewhere? And I guess what I want to throw out crispy is that maybe this is like a general compatibilism problem, and that we have actually figured out most of the answers, but we figured the out piecemeal and we haven't actually put them together because we have these opposing schools and fields. I think that's um, uh, a really, really good point. And I'm going to quote this classic um, contested quote from NLP in general by uh, Frederick uh, Jelinek. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, who claims that he didn't say this, but it's oft quoted despite this, um, which is, every time we fire a linguist, the performance of our system goes up. Um, and I think that this is from a while ago, I think it might have been the eighties or something. Um, and I think the point of that is there was a lot of attempt to use linguistic theory immediately when NLP was growing up and it's old, right? There were language problems when they started the name AI, um, in what was it like the very late fifties, um, you know, uh, McCarthy and Minsky and all these people talking about these things. And then there were two AI winters and probably until very recently, everyone was always trying to figure out how to use linguistic theory, and it's still relatively common. Um, but I think there's this big problem that makes language, in my opinion, one of the hardest problems of all that I think, you know, in, in many ways, we might be figuring out like human memory, even before we figure out language, which is we tend to describe language under the understanding that we're describing it to someone who is using language and therefore understands language. 
and I and linguists do this too. I mean, we can try to escape it. We can try to have formal things, but like linguists don't write algorithms for how to create a language. It's not even clear what that would mean, right? Like how much that have to do with the context and situated part of an agent. Language is like there's this famous um, there's this famous uh, quote, and I'm forgetting the um, person it's due to, but which is like language is a byproduct of um, other uh, or uh, of other activities, right? That like meaning is a byproduct of language being used in context. Um, and I think that makes this very difficult. So I'm not very convinced that we've solved these um, language problems. I don't think that means that there isn't a compatibilism problem. I think there's a lot of good language writing that and and research that isn't being used by um, by machine learning broadly and NLP um, more specifically. But I think there's one thing that we should give them a little bit of slack on, even though I know I'm very critical, which is Yes, there's been a ton of stamp collecting about language, but no, there hasn't been a ton of stamp collecting about the specific models and what they do. And to be fair, the field is very good at that. And those models are different than they were two years ago. Like literally every few weeks or something and people are like, oh, maybe this wasn't even true. So it might be that, you know, I'm sitting here complaining, but the reality is we just don't know the limits of these systems. And that's the important thing, not linguistic theory. Before we can even understand how this interacts with linguistic theory, we need to understand what these models are actually doing. But I still think that you're pointing to something correct, which is if there was a theory that explained this, I don't think even if an NLP um, person was really into it, I don't think they could convince everybody else. I think they would have to show it in the current framework. And that current framework is admitted by the people in the field to be too limited. We don't like our data sets. We need to move on to all these things and we don't know how to create it. So I think there is a little bit of kind of a crab bucket problem where as soon as someone wants to kind of try to exit it, there are too many things that need to happen. And so someone's going to tear them down with a the criticism and it's kind of difficult. And currently the only way to escape that is to have big enough clout in the field to make a conceptual revolution. Very difficult. There's like this, uh, what is it, Quinn? Uh, conspiracy. What's Scott's term? Conspiracy. The, uh, the, the Klo, Kol, Kolmogorov. Uh, Komorak of com complicity. Yeah. Yes, complicity. Sorry. Thing where people, maybe people think about this, but they just can't, you know, talk about it together or come, come together. And it's quite interesting. Uh, crispy and suspended. You know, I get a feeling, Crispy, you come at things, um, from a hard technical side and suspended you come for from more of a you know philosophy side literary criticism is, is that fair or and how do you think your background influences how you think about these things uh you know i think that's fair um i mean just uh you know factually speaking those are our backgrounds um uh my background is pretty much literary criticism. Um, that's what I have a degree in. Not an advanced degree, but a degree. Um, and I have kind of drifted. Um, and, you know, I'm trying to learn more math. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of this kind of project, which I mean, we, we can kind of get into that a little bit. But basically, Crispy and I and a few other people um, who we've kind of brought up or mentioned in this chat, um, have started a uh, a project that uh, goes by a couple different names, but we call it, you know, fail storage or the inexact sciences. I mean, I think um, the project is really in this kind of inexact science um, area that's between the two cultures, as you say, um, this kind of murky ground in the rigorizing pipeline. Um, and then, you know, I mean, we're basically trying to, to create a kind of community that, that brings people from different fields and different perspectives to kind of talk about these issues and try and break down some of these uh, field boundaries um, and make progress on, you know, questions of like representation and, and um, social interaction and game playing. Um, the, uh, I'll just say really quick and then I'll let Crispy answer. The, uh, the fail stores is this really cool example um, from the natural sciences really, but uh, up until the 19th century, uh, this kind of blew my mind when I figured it out or when I learned it, but up until the 19th century, people didn't know what birds did in winter. Like they just really didn't know. And oh, there were nice. a bunch of different theories, um, you know, going back to the Greeks, um, 
you know, several prominent people thought that the birds transformed into different winter animals. So, you know, when, when it got cold, they became different animals and then come spring, they, they went back to being birds. Um, there were some theories, um, I think that they like hibernated. There were some theories actually when the moon kind of came into vogue, I think in the, the 18th and early 19th century, a lot of people thought maybe they flew to the moon when winter came around, but nobody knew. Um, and uh, then in the early 19th century, all these, uh, they started discovering these storks that had, uh, you know, like spears or arrows through their neck and um, flying over Germany, you know, like some hunter would just like see a bird and shoot it down for food and then say, you know, why, why the heck does this thing have a, have a strange tribal, you know, spear through its neck? Let me bring it to the kind of natural museum and Oh, it turns out this spear's from Africa. Uh, so how would that happen? How how could we get a stork in Germany that has like an African spear in its neck? And that's how we discovered bird migration. Um, and that's such an incredible example of how just like one or two like of the right kind of um, examples or case studies or what would normally get written off as, you know, like an anecdotal report or like an N equals one, we wouldn't have to worry about it. There's this kind of other kind of inference that we can do where like it breaks all the logic and we have to reconfigure our sense of reality around this one exception. Yeah. And um, I think this is kind of emblematic of maybe different ways to make breakthroughs in these fields or, or, or think through metaphor and think about the kind of charged example. And thanks. I don't know if this is a tangent, but it seems worth it. I think anecdotal evidence is currently getting a kind of a bad rap. I mean, it's definitely limited, but people's intuitive sense of how sketchy that is, is not adjusting for the media. But currently there is a massively powerful optimization process selecting anecdotes according to criteria that are largely determined beforehand. And so there's a big just epistemic difference between this happened to my sister and the media was able to find this happening to someone with the resources they have to throw into that. I think you should almost completely disregard the latter unless you're looking for a possibility proof. And the former actually seems worth updating on. I mean, sometimes it really will be a crazy coincidence, but by definition, those are pretty rare. No, I, I totally agree. And like, for me, this is the difference between um, talking about existence, like for instance, cow tipping. When I was in high school, <laughs> someone said, wait, cow tipping is a myth. And I was like, well, YouTube exists. There better be one video, one video of yeah. cow tipping. If yeah. it exists. And so I went and looked at no one, literally Nobody. zero yeah. videos. Like, right, like I, just video after video being like, it's fake. And then me going down to the hundredth example. And it's like, no, there's nothing. Yeah. Versus, right, like me, you know, encountering someone who i don't know um is addicted to x drug right yeah. and then being like oh well if i encountered that person then at least yeah. in my general subculture this might this must have some level of population right because it yeah. wouldn't be just i encountered this one example so yeah i i totally agree i think people in this way distrust personal uh, evidence they have personal acquaintance with which is yeah. really disturbing to me actually it, me too yeah absolutely um Crispy, I, I, this kind of sets up an opportunity to chat a little bit about torque epistemology potentially, but do you have yeah. thoughts on um, your on the kind of science side or on fail stores or in exact science and stuff? Yeah, I'll just say one thing because I think you cover the vast majority of it, which is um, I like to say, even though I, maybe it's not the most diplomatic thing for me to say, which is that I'm driven by blind rage most of the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the main reason I say that is because, so I'm, I grew up what I call a literalist. I have this, this term literalist, which is basically like, I just took what people said seriously. Now I didn't think that they were, like I understood that people could lie, but I always kind of had to prove to myself that they were lying before I would accept that. And yeah. because of that, I ended up learning things very weirdly when I was growing up. And then I always thought that I was bad at it for some reason in some capacity, yeah. even though I could tell that I was outperforming people in certain capacities. And now that I'm like, oh, I can actually use this I just have this desire to do things like in a way that I was told I couldn't to some extent, right? Yeah. And so because of that, I hung out with a lot of people who are into kind of more soft philosophy and things like that in, in university, but who are also pretty good at math and some things like that. And I realized I was the only one in my group who was willing to kind of be a diplomat between those two parties. And, you know, I read two cultures and I was like, 
yeah, but no one wants to do this because all the people who could are like, wow, I would spend a lot of time talking to people I don't like. And I just think I had in my heart, you know, enough anger that this was a situation and that basically people are constantly being epistemologically gaslit that I was yes. like, you know what, I just I I'm willing to become a politician to do that because I, I already kind of have the, the cynicism to do it. And so I think because of that, I went hard into technical stuff because I had the ability to, even though I'm not the best, I'm not the best engineer, I'm not the best mathematician, I'm not the best at any of these classic kind of skills, um, or even really close, Some, in many cases I'm below average, but I'm good enough. Um, and I can see a lot of mistakes that people make that I went into this um, space. And because of that, I, you know, I call myself a game A liaison, where game A is, you know, the vast institutional knowledge and uh, knowledge kind of construct. Um, and so I think that's why I kind of come at things from there, because I'm also so used to trying to push the boundaries of game a a little bit all the time um but in order to do that you always have to speak in the right lingo to make sure that you don't have any kind of easy attack surfaces oh quinn, quinn do you, is that a, a common thing for you too quinn like where you know yeah discovering that people don't always mean what they say yeah being surprising I, I strongly relate to that motivation it being surprising and being angry about it and that sense that, you know, I talked to my mom earlier today on the phone and we were just talking about something. I think it was a news story. And I said, well, they're lying. And she said, yeah, that you get really viscerally angry about that. And I think they should not do that. I'm not defending it, but it doesn't make my blood boil which is a good thing to, so I strongly relate to that sense of, yeah, being gaslit and being, um, I think Stephen Case said, uh, when you lie to someone, you sabotage their map of the world. And this is not a decision you should take lightly. You should ask yourself, why I also slash this person's tires? Uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't think any of that actually contributes intellectually, but I very strongly feel where you're coming from. Yeah, I, I really empathize with that description. And, and to me, you know, I think a lot of people find communities like the rationalists, for instance, and like yeah. find their tribe. And I think to me, I felt like I could communicate with people a little bit too late almost. So I'd, I'd done yeah. a lot of assimilation. And because of that, I think I came into this kind of realization that actually... I was, I felt too far down the road. I didn't want to try to go back and feel at home. I was like, you know what? I'm going to actually like be someone who can actually play that game. And like, even though I kind of have the fire in me, I'm going to learn how to tone it down in a way that actually allows me to do both. And that's something that like, it's interesting because I feel like I really, um, I really empathize with a lot of people in the rational sphere and generally people who self describe as autistic and things like that. But that I also like have done so much work to kind of push back against that part of myself in order to understand that world. Um, and that like, I can see why if my, if things had been easier and I'd feel that it was easier to communicate with people at any point, then I probably wouldn't have gone down that road. So it's kind of funny to realize that like, if I'd been introduced, for instance, to the rationalist early on, I probably wouldn't have been here. I probably wouldn't be doing this kind of stuff. Yeah. It's very a uh, hero's journey-ish. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I mean, I think the other thing too, I, you know, I think one of the reasons that rationalists are above average good at producing social insight is because they are like deeply estranged from kind of like naturally. You kind of have to be apart um, from it to be able to see it. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's the kind of Heideggerian, like ready to hand, present at hand idea where like until the tool breaks on you, you don't question how the tool works. But if the tool is already broken for you and everyone else seems to be using it smoothly, you start saying, well, how do I fix my damn tool? How, how does the thing work? How do I like actually, you know, uh, achieve things in the world that I want to? Um, how do I, you know, kind of lower the entropy of, of my actions where like I can do something socially and I won't be completely shocked or surprised by how people respond to it. Um, and that I think leads to a lot of productive reverse engineering. Yeah. The, gosh, there's a, there's a couple of directions that I, I want to go here. I guess one thing I'll say qu super quick, you had that quote about how lying is manipulating somebody's uh, map of yeah. the territory. And I think that's true, but I want to complicate the situation. And I want to suggest that anytime that you um, 
manipulates well basically anything you do in the view of another person is going to change their understanding right just me being around you right now is changing your map all communication changes a map and in this kind of sense all communication is manipulation which i think yes. is an insight that comes out of animal signaling and so the distinction becomes like well it's clear that certain kinds of manipulation the things that normally in kind of the normal way manipulation is used, um, these are bad things. They're either forms of lying or gaslighting or um, being generally shitty that you know we want to kind of discourage or at least somehow like conceptually distinguish from the kind of banal manipulation that I might be doing right now just by informing you or making a point or trying to persuade you of things. I think one line you can draw is you can say, well, okay, all communication is manipulation, but some manipulation is mutually advantageous or some manipulation isn't predatory or some manipulation doesn't misrepresent things uh, strategically. There's different ways you can kind of carve it up, uh, but I wanted to make that complication. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just want to add, you know, for anyone who's trying to think about this, uh, and it seems a little bit too much, just think about how couples change their behavior when they have a child, especially if that child goes a little bit older, and they're like, not in front of the baby. And you're yes. like, oh, wait, why is it suddenly important? And the assumption is that their map is being changed a drastic amount, right? But we never yes. grow out of that at all, right? Like, as soon yeah. as you enter a new community, you start thinking, what are my new hobbies? What's going to happen? What's the taste that I'm going to develop? And things like these. And you're so used to it that you don't do it. But you never you never eject yourself from the kind of baby's map manipulation problem. Yeah. I mean, it, I think, you know, one way to kind of think of it is like... Um, you know, if communication is a form of action, which obviously it is, and people act in order to, you know, affect the change in the world, you know, they, uh, you know, they have some lemons and they want lemonade. And so they need to somehow change the state of the world in order to get to their kind of desired end point. And so if communication is a kind of act, clearly people, you know, communicate because they want things to change. And things can't change in the world with communication unless you have like a competent decoder who will change their behavior, yes. right? Like, like communication uses people as its medium for affecting transformation. Yes. There is no other way. Um, and so if yes. I'm like speaking to a tree, it's gonna change nothing because the tree cannot decode and the tree can't change its information uh, yes. state. It can't change its behavior. I'm not, I'm not even communicating at that point. Um, so that, yeah. Never trust someone if they say, yes. I'm just saying. It's never true. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. right. <laughs> right, right. They're saying it for a reason. Otherwise, they would have stayed silent. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. I wonder. But if... when you're in these games, when you're in these games, even being silent is a move. That's the thing about yeah. these games is once you're in a game, everything becomes a move and becomes interpreted as a move. And so there is no not playing. You're either silent and people will interpret that as move and you're playing or you speak. But right, you're, you're choosing between plays. My father had this study he used to talk about when I was growing up where they got people to uh, talk to a therapist in another room and afterwards rate how happy they were. I don't know if this replicated. He didn't tell me what the name of it was, so I can't just Google it. Anyway, the catch was that the therapist was a tape recorder program to say things like, uh-huh, and yes, go on. And most people were very happy about that. <laughs> this would have been in the 50s, so they might have had a much higher... Uh, prior that I think maybe the effect of I'm talking to a professional therapist was a lot stronger back then because mm. it was newer. But well the Eliza study has been replicated a lot of times where they had an AI yeah. do this on text and like that's been replicated dozens of times. So I, I'm willing to believe it for sure. Suspended, do you wanna I think you want to talk about torque semantics and it feels perfect for this I conversation. Did, yeah. Well, so earlier, Quinn, um, you said that anecdotes have a, quote, bad rep. They're underrated. People yeah. underrate them. And uh, so, yeah, so I'll throw out a couple more concepts that kind of we've been chatting about internally. So one is kind of, we'll call it like torque epistemology or torque semantics. Um, so I think basically implicit in this idea is the feeling that when people say they like something or they dislike something, they're not expressing these opinions in a vacuum. That what they're actually doing is they're saying this thing is under or overrated. Um, and furthermore, that when people kind of state these beliefs, there's always a kind of political dimension to a publicly stated belief. 
Um, and I think you can take an evolutionary um, view of this. I don't think you have to, but I think we can. We can say, well, most people evolved in like small communities and tribes. Decisions were being made. And in such a kind of small community, even one person's vocal dissent might have a meaningful impact over the group decision. Um, and so there's kind of right this, beliefs aren't just what you believe in a vacuum. Beliefs rather to me feel like they're deeply situated and their attempts to somehow um, transform the kind of landscape of belief or the landscape of possible um, political policy outcomes. And I mean policy or politics in a very, very loose sense, not like how we think about governance. And so I think this is, a, I think where I got this idea first was from Bordeaux, who uh, I'll just shout out. Bordeaux, I think, is the best theorist of the 20th century. I think he's the best. Um, I am skeptical of plenty of the kind of continental theorist folks. I think Bordeaux is as good as it gets. So Bordeaux has this um, line. Uh, you know, let me just, uh, I'll bring it up really quick. Um, let's see. So he writes, um, this explains why writers' efforts to control the receptions of their own works are always partially doomed to failure. One thinks of Marx's, I am not a Marxist, if only because the very effect of their work may transform the condition of its reception, and because they would not have had to write many of the things they did write and write them as they did, e.g. resorting to rhetorical strategies intended to twist the stick in the other direction if they'd been granted from the outset what they are granted retrospectively. And so in other words, Mark's writing looks out, he sees a certain kind of landscape of what is assumed, of kind of what beliefs people just hold implicitly and unquestioningly about what things are like overrated or underrated about kind of where people's dominant priorities are. And then he sets out to kind of change that and push it more in the direction he wants it. And so this is where the torque uh, metaphor comes in, which is that you're kind of, it comes from twisting the stick. You're trying, you can also kind of think about it as a tug of war or leverage or haggling, right? Like. Um, when you're haggling or bargaining in a marketplace, you'll start the price too low because you know that the seller will start the price too high and maybe you'll finally get to some place in the middle. And this is kind of the rhetorical or political aspect of the offer you're making. It's not a sincere expression of like what you really value the item as, rather it's like a strategic attempt to like get the best value possible in the end. And I think that this is implicitly like what beliefs are that we essentially exist in like this kind of discursive warfare landscape or this kind of ongoing discursive game in which people keep track of the game state and know like kind of where, where people are headed, what's under overrated, and then they kind of try and affect this. And so when we look at kind of the extreme rhetorics um, politically or even in non-political issues like in fields, or when we look at people calling things, um, you know, you're kicking a dead horse or, you know, we can all assume that people are operating more as if, you know, discourse is a debate in which you score points um, than they are like trying to kind of flesh out a map. And I feel like I'm starting to get incoherent here. So I love crispy chicken to, to help bail me out and maybe clarify any points that, that I've been blowing. Absolutely. Um, I don't think you've been blowing anything. I think uh, when you hear read the room, the question is uh, why? And the answer yes. is because you're expected to be interpreted by the picture uh, of the room, right? And I think one big thing there is if you see someone say X works, why isn't that good? The question is always like, okay, in comparison to what, right? And you see these people saying, oh, well, you know, but it's good. And, and what they're really debating about is whether we publicly are going to agree that it's good. And then we can use this as a public reference point. And I think a really important thing here is a lot of people who, you know, start thinking about this consciously are like, why don't you just say what you actually mean? And if you mean this, and the current discourse is over here, then you have to push way past the point you mean in order to apply enough force for where things are now to reach where you think they should be, right? By definition, this is just literally how force would work out, right? And so if you say what you mean, people are going to meet you, you know, in between, depending on basically how much clout you have in this conversation. Um, and that's never where you want to be by definition. And so you, you really just don't have another choice in order to express yourself clearly. And you'll find that if you do try to express yourself clearly to most people, what happens is 
they, they you meet you in the middle. And then later on, you get referenced as you as if you agreed to meet in the middle, right? And as if that was your real opinion. And so I think, you know, people who think this is super adversarial should consider, well, a lot of the time, it's actually about misrepresenting one's own opinion, that you would feel misrepresented of your as your own opinion, if you don't compensate for how everybody already thinks about X subject. Yeah, the last thing I'll just add on really quick there. So I think kind of what results from these behaviors or systems is that you get, Bruno Latour has a great essay called Why is Critique Run Out of Steam? And it's from the early 2000s. And, you know, Latour is kind of part of that late 20th century um, continental theory scene, um, the, the science studies scene. And he's saying, you know, man, like, did we, what, what, what went wrong? Like, 30 years ago, we felt like we had to push against this kind of reigning orthodoxy of science where like science and progress was going to figure everything out and give us all the answers and, um, and was just, you know, science just discovered the truth and everybody trusted science. They were putting, you know, uh, men on the moon. And now 30, 40 years later, you know, I can go into the, uh, you know, French countryside and find, you know, a quote unquote peasant. And he'll have these kind of like ideas about not trusting authorities and about how like George Bush was behind 9-11 and how the climate scientists are making it all up and we shouldn't trust science. And, you know, I don't know if those kinds of skepticisms of authority and science are essentially new, but I think they've at least become more prominent in some sense. And I think, you know, what he's having a crisis over is that he felt like they were pushing back against one reigning orthodoxy with these kind of deconstructive worldviews. And then in some sense, he feels like maybe they won, but they won too much or they went too far. And now it's like it, they didn't find that kind of middle resting ground where they wanted to be or the kind of appropriate skepticism isn't there. And he talks about um, he he uh, uses a metaphor for his, you know, fellow theorists, including himself. He says the French love revolutions. That these these continental theorists are these kind of like French generals who would just love a revolution, like a brand new clean start. And I think you really see this in French theory, where it's not like, um, you know, Sartre doesn't come on the scene and say, well, you know, previous theories were mostly right, but I want to add on this addendum. I want to, you know, add this wrinkle. That's not actually really how dialectic works. The way dialectic works is Sartre storms in and says, all our theories are wrong. Humans are ultimately and completely free. There is no infringement on our freedom. Um, down to the point where, you know, there are these stories where he's on like a, a ferry ride with uh, Simone and she gets seasick and he's pissed at her because he says, why, why aren't you getting this under control? This is, this is under your power. You're free to not be sick, right? And he's obviously taken it way, way too far about freedom. Like humans aren't, there are obviously serious constraints. Um, and his picture isn't super nuanced, but you kind of get these, like it bounces back and forth between this kind of like structuralist, behavioralist view of human beings, where it's like human beings are just these dopes who walk around running the algorithms that they're programmed by, by the structures they're embedded within, or they're existentially free and nothing can contain them. And hopefully, you know, these kinds of like ping pongings, these kind of like radical revolutions, like, end up with like a, a nuanced dialectical process. Um, but it also seems like oftentimes it leads to these kinds of extremes where the full picture sort of exists, but it exists piecemeal at different times. And so when earlier Crispy and I were talking about kind of this general compatibilism, general compatibilism is basically our idea that like a lot of theories are partially right. If there are a lot of smart people advocating for something, even if the two people are advocating totally different things, there's some way in which both sides are probably right. And so we need to kind of figure that out and figure out how to reconcile and integrate those views into kind of a more complete uh, unified theory. That suggests disregarding ethics, because for me, a lot of it's theoretical, but um, a family of strategies, I remember Elisa Yudkowsky accused uh, Stephen Jay Gould, and I haven't read Gould, so I'm going with Yudkowsky's work, of pretending the Williams Revolution never happened in uh, biology. So he could criticize the pre-existing paradigms, which had in fact been overthrown, and frame it as a revolution. That wasn't uh, all of Yudkowsky's criticism, but it was a, uh, I wonder if that would work. If people really if, if want what would to, work. 
well, mm. if people really want a revolution um, and what you actually want to advocate is very close to the conventional wisdom, relatively speaking, um, you could misrepresent what the conventional wisdom is. Yeah, I'm just curious. I'm curious, Crispy's thoughts on this, but I, you know, I've heard actually in some rationalist spheres the term like a, a simplicity tax get tossed around for talking about like academia and stuff. But basically, th this idea that like, um, um, yeah, that that you know, if you look at like research findings, it's uh, it's usually the most counterintuitive and surprising findings in psychology that get most passed around, where it's like some tiny. Um, things, some tiny contributing factor has some incredible outsized effect. And that's what, you know, gets people buzzing. And, um, but in reality, like most actually true psychological findings tend to be things that basically confirm common wisdom, because that's what common wisdom is. We've had thousands of years to test it and pass it on. It's mostly right. Um, I'm, I'm curious Crispy's thoughts on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think the picture is, is very complicated, but there are two things that definitely jump out to me. One is that I think there is this, basically what Quinn is saying, uh, there's this tendency to, if you can get away with calling something the conventional wisdom and rejecting it, you're golden. And I think a lot of people rush when they see that the times are already changing and they haven't, there's not been a paper about it, to basically write a paper that says, ha, all of you thought this, but really it's that when everybody has already moved on, but no one has had time to write the paper yet, right? Um, and But common knowledge, but it's not, you know, explicit right. knowledge. Right. And, and the complicated thing, right, is we want that paper written, but we're basically writing it so that we are misrepresenting our own history and it will become completely opaque to anybody who tries to study it. And I think this has happened a lot when people go back. So like, there are all of these things that are like, did you know that people in the 50s thought X? And they're referencing some paper, right? And I'm like, yeah, some academic in the 50s said, everybody thinks this, and you're going to trust them? Like that's, you think, yeah. you think this guy is like, A, knows, B, is representing it properly to you because he cared so much about somebody in 2020 thinking, oh, look, this is something that can describe history perfectly to an objective observer. No way. Um, and I think the other thing that happens though, is that something that isn't complicated enough um, is hard to publish. Um, and if it has really good results, fine. You know, you'll always get through then. But if it feels like, oh, your results are good, they're normal for a paper, but you didn't change anything enough, then that's not enough. And I think because of that, we end up in this epistemological situation where we're not really ever certain of anything because all of the confirming evidence wasn't published because anyone who got it was like, am I going to spend, you know, three months publishing this paper that no one is going to cite because they'll just cite the original study that found this? No way. Um, so I think both of those are true um, where, you know, we try to find complicated things um, because that helps us like, you know, sound like we're making the sophisticated advance that no one else would have thought of. And we try to find simple things by making it seem like the current uh, idea of things is actually even so oversimplified from what is actually there. Um, yeah, and I don't, I don't even know. So I guess my main point would be, I don't think there's a way to escape this, but I think there's like, I don't think there's a way to negatively kind of like poke people out of this but I think there's a way to reward people for doing other stuff. And maybe that's kind of the way forward. I think traditionally people have thought about this as like, how can we restructure things in order to be better? I don't think so. I think this is actually very natural. It has nothing to do with academic systems. It has to do with people trying to get clout. Um, but I think that there are ways to build up subcultures that like have different um, kind of dynamic clout dynamics. And I think the rationalists are a perfect example of this. And I don't like, I think there, there's plenty to criticize there, but it is different. And I think I see that as the kind of the future where there is a space for lots of parallel fields that can take things from each other. And that you can write a paper and say, hey, look, I'm taking these assumptions from these places um, and I'm gonna write that way. And I think if things are a little bit less formalized and it matters more who your paper is passed around to rather than what conference it gets into, that's actually a possible future. Uh, you want to give the knowledge logistics pitch? I feel like you're all teed up for it. That's true. Um, so uh, 
uh, John Nurse, who I believe was on this podcast. Oh, yes, um, he was. <laughs> uh, uh, has this term that he's thrown around, knowledge logistics, um, which I think I'm guessing is kind of in metaphor to information logistics, which is, you know, this field of like getting information where it needs to be. And his point is like, look, there are lots of things that lots of people know in lots of different fields. And there's like almost zero like real credential value to passing this around to the right people who could make good use of it. And that's ridiculous. Like that's actually most of what we need to do in science. Like there's tons of knowledge being produced all the time, but like a lot of it is being reproduced because, and not even like to confirm, right? Just in totally different spaces um, because we can't pass the knowledge to different people because no one, it's no one's job to do that. And it would be hard to make a job that does that. And I think, you know, me and suspended and the inexact sciences basic pitch is, well, you know what we should do? We have the internet and we have a lot more complicated ways of storing information. Basically, if you find something interesting, you should write something about it that's short and post about it. And we should have a reference point, not just to the original work, but to what is useful, what's one useful part of it. And then that should be something that's actually we, we consider high value. Um, and I think it is really high value, you know, like, um, our uh, friend is on our server, uh, Literal Banana, who I really admire the writings of. Um, I, I I would say uh, she's my favorite living philosopher. Um, she, you know, goes and looks at studies and she's like, this makes sense and this doesn't. And I, here's why I think so. Um, and I think that's kind of the most useful thing, right? Like right. She, she's earned the highest title for that for me. Um, and I think that's not that hard to create in our current spheres. It's just very hard to create in the current institutional spheres. But I think that, right. you know, in this crisis, right, COVID, there's become this opportunity to say, well, maybe knowledge acquisition and what knowledge we trust should change. And if that's so, then maybe we should kind of have this piecemeal view of it. Because if we keep sending people back to um, Hegel every time they want to talk about dialectics, then people won't talk about dialectics. They'll use different metaphors and we'll <laughs> always be confused. Um, right. But if some people say, hey, here's how I interpret this piece of Hegel and let's talk about it. And there are ways of basically compartmentalizing this knowledge, then I think we're going to have a lot more people talking on the same page. I, you know, Crispy, I, I love that. One of my favorite question, questions to ask academics. So my wife, you know, she works in research labs, psychology research lab. Um, and we'll go to these like yearly parties, you know what I mean? And they'll have it at a little country club and you're just like all these, you know, psychology academics. And I, and everybody starts drinking. And so I, I'm just the odd man out, right? You know, I'm not an academic. And I love to ask them, you know, what is common knowledge in your specific subdomain that would lay people would just find bizarre, you know, like what, what, what's like, you know, everyone knows, but like, it's not written down, um, but people just wouldn't get, and you, you just find the most surprising answers, like from people. It's like, oh yeah, we all know that this is true, but like, you know, learning does not transfer at all. You know, you have no learning transfer. You can't learn how to learn. Like this is, uh, yeah. but you know, lay people would find this just completely bizarre. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, Bordeaux it. says that gossip, you know, is this kind of gossamer that holds fields together, that there's <laughs> all this information that's so crucial to how a field actually runs that gets passed orally and therefore is never recorded and will never actually understand these kind of discursive games historically because the full game state and the context that people are optimizing within and playing within, a lot of it is, yeah, like, like you're saying. Well, Common it, it, knowledge, but not written down anywhere. Right. It, well, it makes sense why, like, you know, NASA in 2012, they tried to, you know, the, the space launch system. They're like, what's the biggest rocket engine we've got? It's the F1 we used on the Saturn V. They went to try and build it. They can't build it anymore. They've got the plans, you know. It's like that. there's this explicit knowledge that, you know, everyone used to be able to talk about in common knowledge, but it's just lost because no one wrote it down. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think Very the sad thing is in in these soft fields, I think more than anything, it's less that no one feels like it's necessary and more that no one's willing to stick their head out, right? Mm. Because you can really get screwed over if you talk about a lot of things that just maybe the public doesn't like, maybe not everyone in your field likes, maybe it invalidates some important person's you know, research agenda to some extent and it's like not the right time to publish it. Um, right. And I think that's the weird thing, which is as far as I can tell, academics are pretty uncomfortable with informal notes. It feels like you're creating an attack surface without any um, without any chance of getting real credit for it, right. um, and I think that attack culture is like is this key thing, and I don't know how to solve it, but I, I see it everywhere once I start to see it. 
do do you think this is a a okay i i I have this thought, is this a new phenomena in the sense that like, I feel like if academia was somewhat less competitive, you know, it, there would be less pressure against these kind of things. It feels like, you know, when there's very limited spots and you're trying to, you know, jam yourself into one of them and elbow the other guy out, anything that will keep you out. And if you don't mind me mentioning Crispy, I know you're an academic uh, or you're, you know, you're, you're gunning for the academic market and um, you know, your name's not Crispy Chicken, like, you know, obviously. <laughs> right. Um, so what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I agree. So I, I hold a controversial opinion, which is, I think it's the result of the professionalization of science that um, basically, was it John Livengood, I think, who used this term first um, in an interview with Suspended, that's where I heard it at least. Um, uh, and basically that, you know, science has become a job. You go right. and you do science for a while and you get promoted in some sense. And it's more distributed than a, you know, a company with a CEO and everything. But it's, it's a job in this sense, in a way that, you know, way back when it was just a bunch of you know, rich dudes, basically, the doing whatever hobby. they wanted. Um, exactly. And then even not that long ago, it was a result of government programs that were structured completely differently. They were not this kind of distributed market. Um, and I think that it's unfortunate um, that the current dynamics of the distributed market are there are certain tokens that are uh, that have um, actual value, and those are called papers and citations. Um, and because of that, everyone is fighting over those. But we can change what papers and citations mean, right? And right. so we have. Um, and so certain things count, and certain things don't, and certain things count in a certain way that helps. Um, and I think that's uh, actually got made the dynamics really bad, um, and it's it's just not good for knowledge acquisition. I don't know what would happen if it was less competitive. I'm not, it might work. I just don't, I really, really don't know. Um, but I think there's especially this thing, which is most papers are, and this isn't true in all fields, but let's say like computer science, for instance, it's a huge field, right? Yeah. Um, uh, most papers are written by PhD students. Right. Um, and most PhD students are not going to become academics. So, you are basically putting something into the system that is going to try that like from someone who's trying to get out of the system. And it doesn't mean they don't care, but there's an incentive, right? To not like do a five-year program, to not like do a comprehensive study, to try to get these papers out because you're competing with all the other people who are just trying to get papers out. And if you stop, you're not going to win. No one's going to stop and applaud and say, look, you're the real scientist. Um, so like, you know, there, there's, there's a line and everyone says, oh, you just got to try to do the work and do good and whatever. And I think that's true in as far as what we want, but we can't just incentivize people by telling them, oh, that's the morally right thing to do. I think, I think you have to change the market. And the market right now is having a PhD is what allows you to be a researcher, even if you're not in academia. And it's very difficult to work yourself way, way up without that. And so I think because of that, we've created this token of the PhD and we valued it in a way that everyone now gains the value of it, which is unfortunate. I, this is a kind of what you bring up is a very Alexi Guzzi point as well, I believe, um, Will, which is, um, you know, the the kind of professionalization of science and kind of the need to, you know, that, that it has fundamentally shifted from a kind of aristocratic um, operation. I, and, you know, it's not even that I think that like an aristocratic operation is, is uh, optimal in any way. But I think personally, whenever I see um, institutions that like basically it sort of seems like you either need to like burn them down and start again, or they're getting badly outcompeted by startups. I mean, this is, you know, getting back to your conversation with Quinn a while back about inadequate equilibria. We've obviously talked about a lot of inadequate equilibria in academia and scholarship and knowledge economies um, today. But like, why why is it possible that a startup can outcompete Microsoft? Like, that's bizarre. Very um, bizarre. There has to be something very weird happening in that institution. Um, that, despite all its money and its talent and its resources, um, and I guess you know, I more and more have been thinking in terms of that that when an institution ends up this way, it's the result of selection games and there being bad selection games. Um, and it's not necessarily that, you know, like the selection games that lead to, you know, which would largely be self-selection, I guess, that lead to people being scientists in the pre-modern era, which is like, 
having enough money and then wanting to spend your life and your money on the scientific pursuit. They're not necessarily the optimal criteria, but they're not terrible either. Um, and there, are, I think there are a lot of bad kind of uh, motivations or criteria or selection pressures, um, you know, filters that lead to, yeah, just, I mean, bad incentive structures. I'm not saying anything that new here, but. No doubt. Well, we talked to uh, Don Braven as well on the podcast a while back. He's like an 85 year old guy. Um, he was a physicist. He ran this program at BP called Venture Research. They got a couple of Nobel prizes out of it for like 6 million bucks. And his whole thing was, you know, he just give like people just enough money, like to live on comfortably, not that much, pursue whatever they wanted to pursue. You know, he checked and went in with them like every three years, like, how's it going? Is it still really difficult? Um, and he thinks he thought there was like this real shift in the seventies where, you know, it used to be, you could get a, a position, you know, pretty much anybody who won a one could get a position making, you know, 30, $40,000 a year, just kind of, you could skate by, say whatever you want. And that, and that really changed in the seventies as things got more competitive. I don't know. That's his crazy thought, but. Seems um, like everything changed in the seventies. Uh, every yes. time I see people point to an inflection point in the economy and social institutions and science, whatever it is, it's like 1972, something, I don't know, but something. That's right. That's right. There's that whole website WTF happened in 1971 when it, whenever. Yeah. It's, it's something's very odd about that period of time. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, this is kind of my personal um, bias. So actually, some of the the very first stuff that uh, I started working on and thinking about seriously um, about eight years ago was nostalgia. Um, I came out uh, before I was into literary criticism. I was really into pop music. Um, and I mean pop music very broadly here, like anything that goes from like the Beatles to like, you know, some folk. I mean, modern folk. I mean, right, like this is like folk music as it was originally defined doesn't even exist anymore. Fo yeah. Folk music is an oral tradition. Like as soon as you're recording and writing down the notes, um, you're no longer, in a, there's folk music doesn't exist anymore. So it's just pop music with folk stylings, right? It's the aesthetics of folk without any of the core structural elements. But there's kind of this pervasive nostalgia in uh, music culture, in my opinion. Um, it's been there for a while. Um, Simon Reynolds has written a book on this called Retromania. Um, but I mean, you see it everywhere. You see it in the folk scene, obviously, where people just, if, as soon as you pick up an acoustic guitar, people think you're the most authentic thing, this side of, uh, right. you know, uh, there's the, obviously there's kind of the Dylan at Newport controversy where Dylan, you know, plugs in and goes electric and he gets booed. And maybe this is, uh, you know, a little over exaggerated in the historical record, but regardless, people were peeved and it's like, why? I mean, if, if what you care about, anything you should in theory care about with Bob Dylan is about like, you know, the kind of ideology and the lyrics and the song craft and whether the guitar is plugged in to an amp or not really just seems besides the point. And yet the symbol of the kind of authenticity of the natural and the historic um, is just so important. And if you read somebody like Paul Fussell on class, you see that like the um, kind of old money and, and the extremely wealthy people don't even fuck with the future. I mean, like like being at all interested in the future is like some cringe middle class. Shit. Middle class. Yeah. Um, you know, like... Uh, you wear you wear clothes that are like you know cotton and these kinds of like non-synthetic like organic materials and you have all these kinds of like you know you eat like uh whole wheat bread that still has yeah. like whole grains and kernels in it and it's all about like, texture and grain and the kind of authenticity of like the nostalgic experience um and there's all these pastoral complexes and uh there's this great book called city and country sometimes I reverse it it might be country and city by um raymond williams where he talks about what he calls the escalator of nostalgia. And so he, you know, digs into the record and he finds a bunch of people in the like the 20s or 30s, you know, in England who are saying, man, I grew up in the last uh, real pastoral age of England. Um, we had a countryside and it's gone. The the British character, like it's gone. It's destroyed. We've, it's we've left the golden age. And then so he says, okay, like, let's go back 40 years. And then he yeah. finds another set of a dozen commentators saying the same thing. And he follows this escalator all the way to the dark ages. And then he says, well, un unless the people in the 17th century really thought the dark ages were hot shit. I mean, there even golden ages historically um, always think that they're in the fall period. I don't think there's ever really, I, I don't know, maybe not, maybe Renaissance era. I, I don't know too much about the history there, but there are so many golden ages that think they're in the middle of the fall. And I think we have to be careful about this kind of what I might call like an atypical present bias, which is this belief that like 
the conditions of the present are uniquely about the present and uniquely true of the present and the past was different. And we think the past is different because we've heard representations from like right. our parents. I like, where do we get these? <laughs> we didn't live it. Like, well, it wouldn't surprise me if in 50 years people look back and say, man, science was so efficient in, in 2021. And maybe yeah. that's because it's just all been downhill since then. But maybe it's also because this is just how brains work. They get nostalgic. Or, it's very difficult to view, you know view one's own age you know objectively it seems but quinn sorry I, I it, it occurs to me that it could be an effect on what gets repeated and broadcasted i remember stephen pinker saying something like um people who say that things are very bad sound like concerned empathic people trying to draw your attention to problems and people saying that things are very good sound like they're trying to sell you something I, I'm not saying I would bet that way, but I think there's a question where this is a sociological question of what gets selected and repeated and emphasized, or a psychological question where all the individual people feel like they're in the fall. A hundred percent. And even as you say that, I mean, it's like um, somebody says, well, you know, the murder rate's down. People don't think, yeah. okay, they're saying the murder rate's down. They're thinking, okay, they're either like excusing the present ideology yes. or if they're complaining about it, they're showing that they care, right? So it's like when we actually think about the meaning, we're really thinking about how are they trying to twist the stick? Like what are they trying to change or accomplish or do politically? We're not actually thinking just about the object level claim as what, what the meaning yeah. is. And so it makes sense that people are optimizing for this kind of implicature of where people stand socially and what they're trying to accomplish politically. Yeah. Yeah. I agree that it all comes back to torque semantics and and just for you know from my part in my um the field that I know about I will say you know I I said all of this criticism about science about machine learning about NLP I think we are making more progress now than at any other point in my field's history like very very clearly a hundred percent now I think I see the issues and I see you know what I can't publish and I that's that's where I come from um and so I think that's 100% true. But I think the other part of it, which has become very complicated in the modern world and which stops me from publishing a lot of things, even under Crispy Chicken, is people's impressions of things are also very hard to manipulate directly. Even if you're like, you're saying, oh, I'm not saying that. You can't convince them that you're not saying that, right? right. Like, so it's like you, in order to feel understood and you manipulate people's impressions and that's hard. And so, you know, for AI, for instance, I fundamentally don't believe that the idea of AGI, of artificial general intelligence is coherent. Like I don't even, not even, it's impossible. I just don't even think it means anything in particular. And I like, you know, that's an entire another debate. But if I say that, I come across as a Luddite, as like trying to be contrarian or something like that, right? I have all of these impressions that I'm giving and there's no way that I can avoid them. And so I think there's this funny thing where one of the reasons we might have atypical present bias, which I think is a great uh, term, is because in order to feel understood, we have to almost only say the things that other people would kind of agree with, and those are the impressions that you can surprise them with. Right. Yes. Um, not crucial, but there's a wonderful, uh, not crucial, so probably not important. Somebody I'd like on, Twitter wrote a really good live journal post a while ago, which was entirely the structure wise. The recent tragic events prove that my political beliefs are correct. And there aren't any. <laughs> I mean, the nature of the tragic events and the political beliefs are not specified. So he essentially <laughs> extracted the structure from a bunch of articles which were saying that about specific tragic events and specific beliefs. And then wrote that. And I think of that every time I see. It stuck with me anyway. I love that so much because it That's gets this, this thing that me and Suspended always talk about, which is basically, you know, there's this problem where if you make an observation about the game, if people are playing, they'll yeah. shift the game in order to make that observation not true. So you can't catch them, right? This is an observation yes. that I think is best described by uh, Addy Murism on Twitter, who was on our podcast that I, I really oh. love. His, I would follow him on Twitter if you guys are interested. He's great. Yeah. Um, and he like I think the issue that me and Smith are trying to deal with is how to describe this without changing everything right without forcing yeah. people to change so that our descriptions remain true and I think the way you do that is by essentially meta level memetics right yeah by describing the meme in a way that it doesn't point at a specific enough meme that people will be willing to change 
Um, yeah. And no one is going to stop doing that because of the live journal post because it's too vague. No one could present it as yeah. evidence against it. And so it's a description that actually has longevity because people won't change it even given the description. Yeah, that works, yeah. And, and I think this gets back too to the, sorry to cut you off, but the anti-inductivity of these kinds of systems, like when people are in this kind of all-out competition, which I think sort of characterizes like elite um, uh, career climbing um, or, or institutions, um, you're in this situation in which um, even if you sort of do learn some of the rules of the game, there are active incentives not to publish them because you're essentially leaking information to other people about what you know and how you're going to behave. And that will change, you know, their behavior and how they optimize around you because you're in these, these systems. But sorry, what were you going to say there, Quinn? Uh, oh, I was going to ask how to spell that guy's name so I can follow him on Twitter. Oh, I, it's just at like a capital A, um, like M-I-R-I-S-M underscore. It's so like Amir-ism as if it was, you know, a philosophy. Oh, yeah. Got it. Our uh, our podcast is failstorage.substack.com. I'm going to do a little plug here. It's a P-F-E-I-L-S-T-O-R-C-H. Terrible name strategically, but you know, it's uh, we'll be high on the Google results. Well, page rank a, will be good. It's, it's our costly <laughs> signal that we actually care about this event because we're willing to ruin our PR over it, right? And I'm yeah. so proud to see Suspended plugging it and doing his proper PR because I'm always exactly. the, you know, the PR guy who's already sold my soul and only does politics anymore. Uh, but <laughs> here I am infecting other people with my memes. I love it. I love it. We'll, we'll include links down in the show notes, uh, all y'all's work. Um, I've got one more big question. I, I, and how are you guys doing on time? I know we're a bit over. I'm whatever. I'm good. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm happy to chat. Cool. Um, suspended. You talked about, you know, Paul Fussell's book on American class. It seems like the narrative. And, and so Quinn and I talked about uh, Charles Murray's coming apart a couple of weeks ago and we had a lot of fun, you know, we read it oh. together and, and talked about it. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious, the narrative around America being a classist society seems to have really fallen apart within the last 40 years. Yeah, you, you know, what's your take on this? And, and, and what do you think about class in America at this point? And I know it's very broad, <laughs> right? You know, it's not a small question. What do I think about class in America at this point? Hmm. You know, I, I think one kind of, view, which I think, you know, when I say something like a typical present, I am introducing, right, a torque. I'm trying to twist. Like, I think basically people overrate how unique or distinct our age is. You see these constant hysterias that a certain politician is like constitutionally unprecedented. Like yeah. if you compare Trump's constitutional breaches with those of so many U.S. presidents, he's really just not. Yeah, he's, he doesn't stand you know, I'm going to pack the court. You don't give a decision. I won't. Yeah. FDRs. Yeah. There's, there's just so many uh, deep uh, constitutional violations. And so, yeah. you know, I think, uh, you know, habeas corpus has been suspended. Maryland, Courts have been yeah. packed. There have been alien and sedition acts where speaking badly about the president could get you thrown in jail. Yeah. I mean, this is just, this is what politics is. This is just what history is. And, you know, so I think kind of one intervention I like in this or one kind of like alternate um, framing is that, Actually, the aberration was like 1945 to like 1995, maybe that there's this kind of weird period in America um, where the middle class flourished and there was a bunch of growth and right. everything was great. And history kind of was like, eh, we're all take a little side break. And uh, and and you had like, you know, just kind of Clinton era politics, Reagan yeah. era politics um, and that kind of history is restarted. So and we shouldn't think about. 2016 or 2021 as like a historical aberration. Rather, we should think that our parents' generation was maybe a little historically weird, and that has led us to be a bit more surprised by history rearing back. So maybe that's the first thing I'll say about this kind of idea that like uh, the idea of a classless America has disappeared. We've had some pretty serious class stratification in this country, um, and some pretty legible class stratification in this country. Um, the other thing I'll say about class is that I think um, 
When, so if we think about anti-inductive systems, some of the criteria, I mean, I don't think systems either are or aren't anti-inductive, but I think there's a spectrum where there are more or less. I mean, the market, you know, the stock market isn't perfectly anti-inductive. It's not perfectly adequate. Let's not kid ourselves. There are all these inefficiencies constantly. People are making money off, off their, off their silly bets. Um, and so, Right, so if we're thinking about what is required of an anti-inductive system, getting back to uh, Crispy's gloss earlier, a big thing is like information has to leak and players have to actually be able to act on that information. So, um, you know, there could be certain kinds of leakages um, in the stock market where there's, it, things are totally out of equilibria, there's serious money to be made. You could 10 times your investment but you need to have $10 million to get in the game. There's just like a certain level investment. And so in that situation, everybody other than the people who have $10 million or more could know the correct move, but unless you know, they can coordinate and pull yeah. 10 million bucks, they can't act on it. So the, the system won't become adequate unless players both can get access to this information and also can act on it. Now, historically, the way that class has been kind of reified and kept stable is that there are all these markers that cannot be copied materially. So you have kind of royal purple, um, which I, gosh, I don't know when, it, I think it goes back at least to Romans, it may go back earlier, but there are these sea snails in the Mediterranean that if you squish them up, um, they let off this kind of purple mucus secretion. And if you take about 10,000 sea snails that you've collected and then you boil them alive and then you crush them, you can maybe dye one garment with purple. And this is pretty much the only known way to get reliable, deep, rich purple garments. And so it becomes very easy to essentially enforce and signal class because there are material restraints. So even if everybody knows that this color purple signifies upper class them, it doesn't matter because nobody can afford to get somebody to go find 10,000 snails and make this Tyrian purple. Um, I think material conditions have changed a lot. And as a result, um, a lot of the markers of class have changed from material things um, to immaterial things. And those might be ideological positions, which are costly to hold if um, you're kind of poor, because if you actually act on those positions or act them out in daily life, they'll put you at a disadvantage. Um, but if you're at a certain level of removal from kind of daily problems or from precarity uh, in the social structure, you can hold and advocate those positions. I don't know, I'm, I'm spitballing, no, but, but those are my thoughts. Makes a lot, of, lot sense. of sense. I'm going to go back over this later, see if I can try it internalize that. That makes a lot of sense. It really does. Yeah, I I totally agree with really everything Suspended has said, and it's it's beautiful to hear. And I think um you know what I take away with this. So I'm uh, learning Mandarin, and I just like I am interested in understanding Chinese social dynamics because it's this whole world, especially because it's this whole you know internet. Like Chinese people only use Chinese apps in general. It's not yeah. very common for them to use Western apps because there's a huge ecosystem of Chinese apps. Um, they are allowed to download them. It's just not something that happens as much. Um, so like, I think something that you see there is you, it, it does put the American class system in stark contrast. Um, because I would say the big difference in some sense is so like the way you get into college in China is called the Gaokao. And it is it's just, test. exactly, it's the big yep. test. That's what really matters. Um, and a lot of people, right? Like their entire life is because they got a really good score on that test. And from yep. then on, it's not like they didn't work hard but they had an opportunity that other people didn't have. I don't think things like that exist in the U.S. very easily. Yeah. I think yes. there was tech for a while, um, and the right people got in on it. You know, like the right people, it's not good. It's just like they're, that, that's who got in on it, and now they feel like they're right. Um, and, uh, and that's very, very much not true anymore. Right. Um, and there's no other clear way to um to go forward because it's still tech right tech is still the main driver i think of value in america um and other than that it's not clear where to go and so i think a lot of the battles become social and yes. social battles do not lend themselves to social mobility because any kind of mobility will be anti-deductively anti-inductively factored out because if someone sees this mobile thing a lot of people will do it and people will start thinking oh this thing that people are doing that makes them look high class is actually just something that people are doing to seem high class. And I don't believe that anymore. Um, and so like, if 
everything we rely on for social mobility has to do with social interaction, then you're screwed. Um, and I think that's the, that's the position that we're in um, as a society in America. It's also like, what is the, the valuable byproduct of, of these kinds of social classes? I mean, as you talked about in a recent post you wrote, one of the reasons that we actually cherish anti-inductive games is because they constantly push players to the edge and beyond. And, and the, the kind of edge of what is possible is constantly evolving because these players are competing. Um, and you can get men on the moon because uh, the Soviet Union and the, the United States are competing. You have these kind of positive, socially positive byproducts, but social status games, I uh, unless sum. they there's have to sum. be structured, yeah. right, there's zero sum and they have to be structured in a productive way so that there's some kind of byproduct that we get out of them. Otherwise, they're just a waste of everyone's time and energy. I totally agree. And, and I think there is this weirdness right now where if someone displays some, you know, great talent for something, it's just not clear how to invest in that right now. I just don't think that it's very easy to actually get something out of that, except with very, very certain talents. And I think that's has to do with a lot of things, mostly with the structure of the labor market right now, um, which like I won't even get into because it's just like, I don't know that much about it. And it's, but I've been reading up on this stuff, but it does seem like right now, you know, it's just this situation of, Maybe you can find friends with your with your hobby, but you probably can't find a career, probably can't find a lifestyle. Um, and if we're in that situation, then where do the byproducts go, even if they're available? Yeah. Well, is that part of, you know, you talk about your field being very healthy, you know, like really like end of the day, you know, there's real problems, but it's, it's pretty healthy, uh, a lot of progress. But, you know, your field is is um, is not regulated. <laughs> you know, it, it is, it is, it's a lot, it's one of the last places, you know, biomedical stuff. It's incredibly, incredibly regulated. It's a billion dollars to get a drug through the FDA, through FDA, you know, and it's like uh, the physical, it's hard to do things in the physical world now in a way that it wasn't, you know, pre 1970s. And so like, there's just limited areas where there can be real growth. No, I totally agree with that. And, you know, it's what Peter Thiel says. There's a lot of innovation in bits and not as much innovation in atoms. Um, and I think there's a reason for that, which is if you if you made something, then someone will pass a law about it and you'd be totally screwed unless you're a big player, right? Um, and like, this is what Tesla did, right? They basically were like, oh, we're not going to sell if you don't let us sell in your, like in our own dealerships. We're just not yeah. going to sell in places where you have to sell through a car dealership. Yeah. And because they were big enough, they could take that hit. Um, and then places change because they took that hit. But if you're small, you can't do that. And so everyone's playing around with software because you can't stop me, at least right now, from writing a program and from a lot of people using it and from that being cool. And I think, by the way, this is the arbitrage. So I would say easily half, if not more, of the most important papers in my field in the last two years were um, from industry labs. Oh, really? And I think that's because, you know, peer review is a kind of uh, regular um, regulation, right? Right. And uh, a lot of these things were self-published at first, right? Uh, and I think one of the crazy things, right, is I bet you guys have heard about GPT-3. Yeah. GPT-3 yes. was not published at an NLP conference, even though it's a very, very language focused, if you ask me, right? Um, yeah. It was published at NeurIPS, you know, Neural Information Processing Systems. Um, and I think that's to avoid regula regulation because I think the larger neural network space is just so big, it's hard to regulate and it's much more distributed. Um, so I think, you're, I think you're absolutely right. I think there's this element of, of regulation. And I think the problem now is, right, there are so many things you have to pay for. People are getting nervous about like just the, the ability for you to kind of self-fund like Kickstarter or Indiegogo or for like Substack for people to pay for Substacks. Now there are too many Substacks. Right. And so even if there's no regulation, there's kind of too much competition. Right? I have this kind of line that like, if there's too much competition in a market, there are too many options. The biggest problem is actually just selecting anything, even if it's already good. But you have to select from a million options, then you're already incurring too much overhead on the customer and maybe they won't buy anything at all. Um, so I think we're in danger of getting into that zone. And I think software is already kind of there. But I agree with you that, um, you know, biomedical is a perfect example of, it's very clear that because of regulation, there's just can't be as much innovation. Even though life sciences are moving pretty fast, I think you could get 10x on that if there was if there was like less regulation. Okay. But obviously, you know, like we're in the middle of COVID, there's there's reasons to have regulation. And so it's it's really not clear to me where you should fall down on that. Yeah. Well, and I do think, you know, life sciences, I think it's fairly healthy, but the translation is like terrible. Yeah. Like, okay. you know, like the, the real world. Uh, Quinn shared a post with me recently where the guy who invented the incubator for um, 
babies. You know, he just like invited, yeah. what was it, Quinn? Like he invited babies to come down and like try it or something. It's just like insane. Yeah. To think about. It was, uh, he was testing it on babies that were, uh, that they thought were going to die anyway. Yeah. And people were basically saying, well, they're going to die anyway. So I guess you can use them for science. And it was funny that like, I don't think we would let him do that today, no. even though it's really hard to articulate a downside. There's an amazing William James passage in one of his books. Um, I think he's trying to figure out whether, um, you know, this was probably in the 1890s. I don't know, maybe early 1900s. He's trying to figure out whether the kind of climbing instinct is learned or whether it's kind of programmed in there the same way that like, you know, a fawn just knows how to walk. And yeah. so he, he has this great line. He says, you know, I'm not brave enough to try it, but um, perhaps if science is lucky one day, there will be a disgruntled scientist bachelor out there who, you yeah. know, recently widowed will be in possession of a young child. <laughs> um, yeah. And with the mere application of one blister each morning on the heel of this child, um, you know, through through a, a torch, uh, you know, yeah. just stuff that just is, you know, crazy nowadays. But uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> love that those pesky ethics why do we ever listen to them yeah. there's no problem with disregarding ethics nothing you, that couldn't end up bad yeah i have to share <laughs> with was... you guys the <laughs> william james which i am now sh screen sharing on my screen oh, that's because awesome. that's that's the cowboy that invented american pragmatism if you wanted to know <laughs> where philosophy comes that's from amazing <laughs> We could do like a little based or cringe uh, segment here, you know, based Wittgenstein, James, definitely. I mean, I don't know, the pragmatist, uh, you know, if we're thinking about like who is foundational in me and Crispy and Hazard and the other people who are kind of in this cruise thinking, I feel like, uh, yeah, pragmatism just seems so important and it's crazy how underlooked it was kind of in the history of, of philosophy and thought, but Dylan yeah, is in my opinion. James yeah. is the man. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Crispy and Suspended, I have to run to a, a Astral Codex 10 meetup. I'm running actually here in a few Very minutes. Very nice. Um, oh. Yeah. I, I, had, I have one more question. Um, Absolutely. And I, I, I got to be careful I phrase this. Um, this, is, this is, which gets back to everything we've been talking about. Yeah. Um, you know, Quinn, I, I don't know if you share this with me, but instinctively, and I've really enjoyed reading y'all's work since y'all reached out. Um, it's really good. And um, I highly recommend it. But before that, you know, I instinctively, whenever I saw things that were continental adjacent, like continental philosophy adjacent, I would like just run away screaming. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not, I'm just not going to touch it. Um, you know, I just don't like when it, you know, people are talking in this certain way. And I'm like, I remember my, you know, literate critical theory classes. I'm like, are you even saying anything at sometimes at points? So I, I, guess, I guess my question is, could you steel man continental philosophy? And is that too tall a task for the end of the podcast? I don't know. That is, you know, taken taken broadly, that it, it is, is too tall broad. a task. But, you know, I think the way that interaction works is that people don't actually exactly answer each other's questions. Rather, they use it as an impetus to say something, you know, valuable to keep things going. So I'll, I'll take that tack. Yeah. I think I think I can, you know, steel man certain ideas that... Yeah. that get that people see as, as a hallmark, you know, obviously it's a big field that has had a lot of ideas and a lot of disagreements, but, of people, um, you know, to take like the social construction of reality. Um, yeah. so I think one of the ideas that's been blowing my mind lately, I've been late, uh, catching up on Alfred Schutz, who is a kind of like, uh, phenomenologist, sociologist, he kind of tried to sync up the disciplines. Um, and so his whole thing, um, Basically, and this is such a, a deep kind of less wrong idea that I hope I, I'm not sure if I can explain it very well. So I hope it kind of just resonates. There's this idea of kind of like decisions rules where like, if we say this item is X, if we categorize it this way, now we know what to do with it. So you walk in and your doctor wants to put you in a box. And if you can figure out what your diagnosis is and slap a name on it, the name isn't so much important, but the name carries with it a set of treatments. Like, okay, now we know what to do with you. I can either like refer you to somebody or I can give you a prescription or there's a set of, of behaviors that come from the category, right? And this is in, I think, 
a big part of Yudkowsky's philosophy, um, which I think partly comes out for him of the general semantics trajectory. So I know Asai Hayokawa, following up and expanding the ideas of Korzybski, um, talks a little about this. He talks about abstraction and the way that people say, oh, you're part of this category, therefore I'm going to treat you this way. And it creates all these kinds of errors in thinking because the category maybe isn't the best way to carve it here. It's not relevant to the task. Um, and so, you know, I think a core idea of pragmatism, for example, is that like the concepts, the way you carve up the space always has to be, uh, it's always, there is no right carving. There is a pragmatically correct carving that distinguishes the way you want to distinguish for the task at hand um, and that draws the lines where you need to draw them to accomplish a goal, right? So, um, you know, to kind of pill maybe people who, lean rationalist out there, this idea is very deeply continental. Um, I think that probably its best proponent is Alfred Schutz, but it comes out and it begin, begins, it becomes the very basis of this concept of the social construction of reality. And so the idea of the social construct of reality comes from, so Schutz um, has this idea that we basically have he calls it typification. So we look out to the world, we say, oh, that's a dog. And now we know how to interact with the dog. Like there's certain things we can do in public with a dog. And there's certain things like if it's a pit bull, we might be a little worried. So because we've categorized as a pit bull, now we're going to be a little worried. And so this like deeply guides us. Uh, William James, he has this idea that like perception might be this blooming buzzing confusion, but we put it into this kind of, we schematize it, we turn it into a bunch of categories that are related, and now we know how to behave to it, and it feels under control, even as the reality is that it's still very fluid and messy. These constructs, these concepts we have don't actually exist in nature, they're aspects of the map. We uh, design these concepts in order to get things pragmatically done in our lives. These carvings don't exist in nature, Plato is wrong, right? There is no such thing as the form of a table. Um, so if you start thinking about it that way, well, if we're walking around with all these constructs, these constructed concepts, and they determine deeply our perception, they determine how we act, they determine what we think things are, they determine, they structure our perception before it even hits our like higher cognitive functions. I mean, I, I don't know if we really need to get into, uh, that seems to go too, too much out on a branch to say that maybe there's like these levels of perception, but in predictive processing, you could see these kinds of categorizations happening very early in the process so that you can never break out of the categories. There is only the categories. So you live in this kind of prism, this matrix of constructs. Um, well, that's starting to sound a lot like a, a constructed reality that you live in. And where did that reality come from? Well, people invented it. When people say reality is social construct, socially constructed, I think they're performing a torque maneuver. What they really mean is that a lot of the reality that we take for granted, that we act on, that we reify or essentialize as just being a part of the world is in fact just part of our map. That we live in our map and not the territory and that aspects of the map which are socially constructed and pragmatically constructed are constantly influencing our behavior and are all we really have at the end of the day um, so sure, physical things exist. They're, they're not denying physical reality at all. Um, but they're saying that effectively our navigation of the world is in this deep social constructed social reality prism. Um, we can't quite escape it. And like, like I kind of alluded to before, it's this torque maneuver where they're saying social reality is constructed because it's revolutionary. Yes, they are overstepping, but everybody oversteps. That's how discourse works. People don't say X is a little like this and a little like this. They say X is Y. They right. say meaning is what the author intends. They say meaning is what the reader interprets. And then you have two people who are standing on the opposite side saying, no, meaning is this, meaning is that. No, no, meaning is this process that dynamically happens between the speaker and the listener, and there's no real truth to it. Um, but people feel the need to go out on these limbs and exaggerate. So. Yes, I mean, I can, I can sort of hold the continental folks accountable for the fact that they've been mis misinterpreted. It, in some sense, it's very predictable how they've been misinterpreted and that people think that they're literally denying physical reality, that they're not naturalists in some sense, that scientists identify as naturalists. But on the other hand, I think if we were able to extend a little bit of interpretive charity, we would also be able to get a lot of insight out of them. Gotcha. Definitely. Uh, that, Sorry that was, for the spiel. Really, no, that, that was really well put. And, you know, um, you know, where should someone get started? You know, like if someone Bordeaux. has a Bordeaux. Okay. Anything um, okay. in particular? The things I love. So I think um, if you're John Heritage has a great book called Garfinkel and Ethnomethodology, um, which is primarily about um, Harold Garfinkel and his kind of theory, ethnomethodology, um, which actually, interestingly, 
Um, so, you know, continental theory, roughly like in the kind of intellectual uh, uh, narrative, there's like a structuralism, you know, in like the 50s and 60s, and then that becomes like post-structuralism in the 70s, and it kind of coincides with post-modernity. Um, and so there was kind of this alternate response to structuralism, which was ethnomethodology. And it was a different approach and it never really took off. I think it might be a more interesting approach than post-structuralism per personally, but uh, the best people there are Garfinkel and Kenneth Lieberman. And they're very much working in the continental tradition because they're phenomenologists first and foremost like Schutz. But if you want to get, I think the best intros to these thoughts are John Heritage's book, uh, Garfinkel and Ethnomethodology has a chapter on phenomenology and it covers uh, kind of the typification stuff that I talked about. The second thing for Bordeaux would be, he has this great collection of essays um, called The Field of Cultural Production that is all about, I mean, he just has such a rich kind of conceptual space. He sees these people kind of in arts or in academia as working in these fields where there's a space of possibles and these space of possibles have these kind of incentives attached to them and certain amounts of symbolic capital. Um, you know, his, I guess to give a final pitch for Bordeaux, Bordeaux's symbolic capital ideas in the 60s, 70s, 80s are basically an alternate invention of signaling theory, and they happen concurrently in different disciplines, almost totally isolated from each other. But human signaling, I think, is most richly thought of through Bordeaux's like 70s and 80s sociological work. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, those are my interests. Yeah. Awesome. They're already on the way to my house. <laughs> Jeffy. Uh, that, that's super cool. That's super cool. I'll definitely check those out. Uh, Quinn, uh, any any last thoughts? Any questions? Oh, I have a Christy lot to sister? think about. I think I learned a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Crispy and Suspended, I'd love to have you guys back on with Quinn and I if you if huh. all are ever interested. It'd be a pleasure. That sounds yeah, that sounds lovely. I mean, yeah, I got I want to talk to Election Games at some point, and I would uh, love to hear uh, yeah what you guys are interested in and in working on. Um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It was Very a pleasure. Cool. Well, um, uh, one more time, uh, where can people find you guys work? Where would you like to us to send them? And we'll mm -hmm. put links and everything, but you know, what we'll mm -hmm. go listen. Yeah. How about, uh, so, yeah, go, go for it. the two I can think of are the inexact sciences.github.io. Um, and then, uh, fail storage.substack.com. I agree. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks guys. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. It was a total it was a pleasure. Pleasure. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week with a new episode of Narratives.